Help me welcome to the stage. He is the son of a school bus driver and a construction worker. He is a proud HBCU graduate of FAMU University. That's right, oh, HBCU. Alice. He was most recently the Florida gubernatorial candidate. Please help me bring to the stage Andrew Gillum. Uh, thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Fran. Hey, everybody. What's up? Hey, hey, Delisa, hey guys, thank you, please. All right. All right. Good so, afternoon. Good afternoon, thank hey, you for hey being here. Hey, everybody. I know y'all are eating, I hope you are enjoying lunch. <laughs> so I know we have very limited time, so we're gonna hop right into it. I understand a certain senator had a lot to say this morning, so we're gonna <laughs> get right into the conversation um, as you guys in enjoy your lunch. So um, I just want you all to know that I have been given permission to call him Andrew. I'm not taking such liberties as certain Republican candidates did on the campaign trail. <laughs> so I'm going to refer to my good friend here uh, as Andrew today. Um, so Andrew, because we don't have a lot of time, yeah. I want to hop right into it. Um, as you know, I watched your campaign very closely uh, on the trail. And I think so often when people talk about what it means to be electable, they think about appealing to white swing voters, um, which I would argue may not exist these days. Um, you know, if you're a swing voter, you kind of know where you stand in, in this time with the Trump administration. Um, you redefine that. You challenge people that to say that maybe being electable means energizing communities of color. Maybe being electable means uh, appealing to younger voters who are not happy with the way that the, the country is going. So can you kind of walk us through your campaign apparatus and how you were able to organize on such a grand scale uh, in the largest battleground state in the country of Florida? Got it. Got it. Well, I appreciate that. And again, good afternoon to everybody. And Tiffany, it is good to be here with you. And I see, uh, for the faces that I can see, some very familiar faces amongst, uh, amongst those of you in the audience. And um, to accept your premise around sort of redefining what it meant to run in a swing state, um, I will tell you that a lot of folks uh, in my state, in the state of Florida, and I think it's probably true around the country, surmise that in order to be competitive in a state like Florida, that we have to put up our most conservative version of ourselves. Um, that we've got to find the candidate who is just uh, a little less offensive, uh, a little more like what might be the majority of the population, and someone who might otherwise, if you will, tiptoe around some of the more divisive issues. So for instance, I leaned into the fact that I believe that stand your ground has no place in civilized society and ought to come off the books in my state. Um, I leaned into climate change and the fact that it's a real threat uh, to the future of the state of Florida. I leaned into criminal justice reform and healthcare as a right and not a privilege. And I want you to know that for the first time since 1994, a Democrat got closest to being governor of the state of Florida by a difference of 0.4%. So if there's a, if there's a, and, and I gotta tell you, it, it, it feels obviously a little bit tough as a person who's really competitive to celebrate or in any way acknowledge what it means when you didn't walk across the line as the victor. Um, and I want to tell you, I still struggle with what that means today, not just for me, but for the people for whom we stand in the gap on behalf of. Um, there are real lives that hang in the balance of what happened in this election. But if there are some upsides, it is that Florida flipped two seats that were previously Republican in Congress to Democrat. If there are bright lines, we saw some pickups in the legislature, if there are bright lines, and you heard from 
uh, Desmond a little bit earlier is the fact that Amendment 4 passed and now 1.4 million people have access to the ballot box. And that was because of hard work done by everyday folks who again understood what was at stake and a really brilliant, brilliant campaign. And so even though I didn't get the opportunity to walk across the finish line as, a, 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 as the next governor of the state of Florida in my transaction, um, there were a whole set of other transactions that happened that I believe makes Florida the kind of state that in 2020 could absolutely go blue and we see a more representative democracy. So you brought up Amendment 4, mm -hmm. and I, uh, as I was watching the polls come in, I found it really interesting that there were people who voted for Amendment 4 but did not vote for your candidacy. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I think um, the campaign... Well, we should tell people first, I'm sorry, what uh, Amendment 4 is. That's right. Amendment, Amendment 4 uh, was a ballot initiative to the uh, amendment to the Florida Constitution that through its passage set in motion the opportunity for 1.4 million people to have their rights, previous uh, um, um, uh, folks with felony convictions, to have their rights restored. And um, if our understanding is correct, January 8th will begin the process uh, of registering to vote and participating again in the process. Uh, Florida was one of the few states where if you had a felony conviction, your right to vote was permanently stripped from you and you had to go and sit before the governor and the cabinet to beg to have your rights restored. Obviously a serious and a real injustice. Uh, Desmond and through uh, the hard work of volunteers and an amazing organization that they built and many of you all who poured into that effort, um, that amendment was successful in passage. Now one, I gotta give credit to those who worked that amendment and I think that was extremely important. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that the majority of those individuals, while African Americans and people of color are disproportionately represented and the number of those who don't have their rights, um, the majority of them are white. Um, and my guess is, is that, and again, the campaign had to take a very nonpartisan approach, but if you're on the right, and you see blue collar, you know, uh, 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 white residents of Florida who don't have their right to vote, you probably are making the calculation that you might have as equal an opportunity to engage them for your side as we might conclude we have an equal opportunity to engage people of color toward the Democratic side. Nothing about this thing is automatic other than the fact that 1.4 million people have the ability to go and register to vote. But I will tell you today, in my state, there are 1.4 million people with the right to vote who are not exercising that right to vote. So we've gotta be really serious and intentional about treating voters as citizens and as consumers and as contributors to our democratic process. And they gotta be engaged just like any one of us would want to be engaged in the process. That nothing is automatic there other than the ability to get them registered. But we gotta go and have serious conversations around the reason why it's important to register is not that uh, a transaction around an election, but the fact that you can go and now advocate for ban the box legislation yeah. to remove restrictions that right now don't allow you to get a job and go to work and earn a wage where you can take care of yourselves and your family. Your advocacy and through your voting and your ability to put people in office who share your belief that that's why it's important to go and vote and participate in the process, not just for democracy's sake, as much as that hurts me. I wish all of us were compelled by the sacrifices of our ancestors that we go and participate in the process. But for far too many people, there's so much more on the line for them right now in their very present lives that, that, that they gotta be given much more of a reason to get out there and to participate in the process beyond it's the right thing to do. So you talk about engaging this uh, electorate and former President Barack Obama has said, don't wait for another me. Don't wait for a candidate to give you goosebumps to engage in this process. You actually gave people goosebumps in Florida. I've talked about your campaign numerous times um, um, on air and there were people who uh, came out and there was a new electorate of people 
who voted for you. Um, and I think even though when we look at this in the macro, that the House won 40 seats and now Democrats have control, um, uh, at least on the lower chamber in Congress, there are people who were emotionally attached to your campaign. There were people who were emotionally uh, attached to Stacey Abrams' campaign, Beto O'Rourke's campaign. And so there are still some people who feel emotionally defeated in this process. Yeah. Um, two questions. One, what do you say to those people? And two, um, talk specifically to this room full of organizers and activists how you were able to tap into and encourage this electorate in Florida um, and yeah. get some of the people who were new to the election process to the ballot box. Yeah, so first of all, I don't know if anybody was more emotionally attached to this thing than I was. <laughs> and uh, and, and as, I, as I admitted, you know, when I got on the stage, uh, it still hurts, but not for, I think, some of the reasons that we might think it hurts. Um, everything that I talked about on the campaign trail, I tried to make as relatable and personal to my lived experience as I could. Um, as Tiffany said when I came out here, uh, my mother drove a school bus for the Miami-Dade school system and my dad was a construction worker. And when construction work got slow in Florida and in Miami where we were growing up, my dad would sell fruits and vegetables on the street corner. My mother, when Florida got rid of summer schools, she became a presser in the dry cleaners up the street from the house. Um, there's seven head of kids, my mother and father. Um, I'm number five of seven, and the first of my siblings to graduate from high school and the first to graduate from college. Um, I know what it means in a real way to see intergenerational poverty disrupted thanks to a good public education. So when I got out and talked about paying teachers what they're worth, when I talked about what it meant to watch my mother and father trade between which bills they could pay before something got cut off, when I talked about what it meant to have to wait for the free dental clinic to come through the neighborhood in order for us to have our teeth cleaned as a reason as to why it, uh, it is that healthcare ought to be treated as a right and not a privilege, not because my parents were lazy, or because they didn't care, or because they wanted somebody to give them something. They got out there and worked every single day. They did everything that they could to make a way for me and my siblings. And so if folks felt emotionally connected, I think it was because I wasn't shy about sharing what my lived experience was. I wasn't embarrassed about what it meant as a kid spending brown money and red money and off-color green money, which was known as food stamps. There's not a debit card. Uh, so much different than going to the grocery store with those brown dollar bills, right? Um, but, but I remembered that and I tried to put it into a context that I felt like whether or not you shared that experience the same way I did, that maybe if it was illuminated for you, not in some talking head on a TV screen and not in somebody's ragtag commercial trying to describe who I was and what my lived experience was, but if you heard it from me, then maybe you might have a different humane connection to it. Yeah. And that even if you don't agree with me hook, line, and seeker on every issue, you might believe that I'm, I might be worth my salt. Yeah. And that the things that I'm talking about that I believe so deeply in, and that if we actually did the work to address those issues, that we could create a state that was better, not only for those of us who were suffering under the pressure of that, but those of us who were spending our wheels and our money in a system that isn't making it better for anybody. Not, in, not me, not you, and not those of us who complain about how much money it takes out of the system and out of the process without ever thinking more, I think, completely around, well, guess what? If we provide an opportunity to learn for all kids and those kids then go on and graduate and then have some efficacy and some dignity around themselves in their lives, then maybe they're less prone to commit crimes and maybe the crime rate grows down or maybe they get access to jobs that are skilled labor where they're not trading between which bills they could pay before something got, gets cut off. Or maybe it is that if we actually lean into our environment, not only do we help to save it for the future, but we actually create some jobs that are domestic jobs that pay good wages, that keep our talent in our state, and by the way, saves the planet at the same time. That I think that there are other ways in which we had to talk about it. So I'm as emotionally connected to these things as anybody. And I think what we've gotta do 
and, and, and certainly in my state, we got to learn this lesson quick, fast, and in a hurry, is recognize that these are conversations that have to take place inside election cycles and outside of them. That for me to be responsible as a candidate um, with two months time to go from zero to 100%, to start a conversation in a community that hadn't seen us, hadn't heard from us, don't know us, don't know what Democrats think, what we believe, and all of a sudden to be able to hook them and turn a miracle on election day, the truth is, is that this stuff is hard. Y'all yeah. know it because you're doing it. Yeah. And the fact that in a, a, a campaign, we're supposed to fast speed and skip over the entirety of the process of building trust and having relationship and talking to people about the issues that concern them every day of the week, not just in a presidential or gubernatorial election, that we're supposed to fast Fast forward past all of that, and they're gonna show up and vote for us on election day? Now we created some form of a miracle. The typical turnout in the gubernatorial election in Florida the previous cycle was about six million voters. In our election, we had 8.5 million people vote. <clears throat> we, saw, we saw near presidential level turnout in the state of Florida. And we saw that also in other states around the country. But to think that we can fast forward through the difficult, laborious work of meeting people where they are, hearing from them, having difficult conversations, engaging them not just on who a Supreme Court nominee is going to be, but how it is that they're going to get access to a job yeah. that pays them a good wage, yeah. how we deal with this uh, 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 crisis around uh, health care. In my state where 15% of people don't have access and in the state of Florida where today 44% of the people in the state of Florida say that they cannot make ends meet at the end of the month. 44% near half the people in the state of Florida. And so we can't rush past that. And that's why the work between now and 2020 and then 22 in my state and I think all over the country requires that we figure out ways to be a more regular, authentic, real conversation with people in problem solving. Yeah before we go and ask another person for another vote. Right. So you said a lot that I want to unpack. Um, I want to first talk about um, how you talk about you engaged this huge, and you had to turn out Barack Obama level numbers in Florida. Um, a lot of the conversation around voter suppression this past election cycle mm -hmm. centered really on Georgia yeah. and Brian Kemp and his obvious voter suppression tactics. But Rick Scott was no friend to, to voters either. Um, the court ruled against him to have some early voting sites on college campuses. Right. Um, you had quite the uphill battle to climb. Mm. Talk us through some of the issues you faced um, through the lens of voter suppression, and if you can, again, to this room full of organizers, as we look to 2020, what are some tactics and strategies um, that people can employ to combat some of those challenges going yeah. into 2020? Cycle? Well, I'll tell you, this, this, this room knows better than most rooms rooms that voter suppression has evolved from you know fire hoses and dogs uh, and literal barricades in front of uh, election uh, and polling places um, uh, 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 and poll testing right uh, it shows up in a lot of different ways which by the way before I say anything further I got to congratulate everybody in this room who worked on the defeat of Judge Farr uh, to make sure that he did not uh, get any further in this process. That's, that's important. But everything from the types of identification that is required, right? Like you could go in with a hunter's license, but you can't have a student ID card, right? Uh, uh, when you go in and, and, and try to uh, submit your, your credentials for voting or the purges that take place between the process. If you haven't shown up and voted enough and at high enough frequency that you go in and your name is, isn't on the list and therefore you have to vote a challenge ballot. And the only time that challenge ballot then gets counted is if you're close enough in the margins uh, uh, in an election that they go back and they force the count. Or that in the state of Florida you deal with the fact that a, when you complete your absentee ballot and you sign your name, and you send that in, that on the other end of that, a non-expert, a non-signature expert, gets to look at that form and determine whether or not your signature, the W in the, your signature this year matched the W in your signature last year, and could void your entire ballot based off of whether or not the signature look, looks exactly the same. Now, I have to tell you, I've signed my name on a lot of stuff. 
I've been mayor. I've been elected for 16 years. I can promise you right now my signature is not the same between all those documents. Some form I have a shorthand. When I'm feeling rushed, it might be a little short and maybe a little longer. When I got all the time in the world and I think it might matter, it will be the prettiest one you've ever seen, right? Um, the fact that in some places where you know early voting participation is going to be high on uh, church Sundays that are the souls to the polls Sundays, yet you understaff the precinct and therefore folks spend an hour and a half in line or during the week when you know you got to go, you know, these folks have, get, have to go off to work that they're spending that much time because we haven't done the proper investments that in the state of Florida, 70 percent of the signature absentee ballots that are rejected are from people of color. What's so different about people of color signature that the ballots are rejected at such high rates and levels of frequency? Or in my state, across the northern panda, handle, you had supervisors of elections that solicited fax uh, uh, ballots, and they allowed people to email their ballots in, in some of the more conservative parts of the state of Florida. Um, these are real issues, and the truth is, is that we have got to deal with these things not just in the context of the election and in the days and the weeks before the election, but we got to have volunteer teams that in a state like Florida where 67 counties and 67 supervisors of elections may have 67 different processes for how they cure a ballot and how they administer elections in those places and what the ballot form looks like, that in the Haitian community where they have a practice in Haiti of putting an X next to the person that you're choosing or underlining the name or circling the name, that we've got some cultural competency issues. And therefore, it might require a process where you let the public get in on saying, uh, weighing in on the ballot design before that ballot is then mass printed. Or the instructions are so close to the name of the top tier candidate, in this case, Senator Nelson, that the instructions merge practically into that election slot and 20,000 people skip that one slot at the top of the ballot. So it shows up in a lot of forms and we've got to get that much more sophisticated and that much more vigilant. One, in pushing for the kinds of change that's needed electorally through elections reform work that happens through the legislature. Now, I'm not holding out hope that we're going to have a lot of luck in my state that now has a Republican governor mm -hmm. that will, for the first time, have a Supreme Court that does not include one African American for the first time in 36 years and one of the most diverse states in all uh, the country. Um, a governor, a legislature, a house, a senate um, that is Republican. Uh, maybe they don't wake up and, and, and try to seek the change that we need, but then that means we got to resort to the courts and we got to resort to the 67 counties that are administering elections and trying to impact the process at that level. But we cannot give up. We cannot give way. Um, not in this state. And, and even when we win the elections, as we see in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and in Michigan, now they're going back to figure out ways to make it even harder for folks to vote. If you don't have anything to be afraid of, if you believe that your vision for the future of this country and your state is so compelling, then let everybody vote. Let the folks vote and count the votes. If you believe so much in what it is that you're doing, that your prescripts are the right things, are the right solutions for your communities, then open it up and let the people vote. But that's not what we have happening here. They're fearful that as more people show up in the process, particularly more diverse communities show up in the process, that the real story is going to be told, and that is that the vision that they have for the future of this country is inconsistent with what the majority of us to believe. And that's why they work overtime to keep people from, from accessing the ballot box. And so we gotta be vigilant in that. Right. And obviously in Stacey's case, it was, it, was, it, it was a notch even worse, right? right? She's running against the man who is the, who is the referee yeah. <clears throat> and also a player on the field. Right. Who's setting the rules, who are shutting down precincts and places and communities of color. Who, I mean, it was, it was egregious what we saw happen there. But I will tell you, probably no less egregious than what we saw happen in many other places where the suppression is now ensconced in the law, where it exists on the books. And therefore, um, um, our challenge is wide, is massive. Right. And we need groups like those in this room to really help us out, not just in election cycles, but outside of those cycles so that we can ensure that the rule book 
um, is the right kind of rule book as we enter 2020 and, and, and 22. And, and not just with voter suppression, but yes, please. <laughs> Not just with voter suppression, but there's also, you brought up the Republican-controlled state legislatures, mm -hmm. which is rampant across the That's country, right. who controls the districting maps That's right. um, in a lot of municipalities. I do want to talk about um, race, um, race in your race. So, My race? Um, yes. I don't, I'm black. I don't want to monkey up the conversation, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> um, but there, so one thing that I, I've been asked that makes me want to pull my hair out is, um, you know, Tiffany, th did Andrew Gillum talk about race too much on the campaign trail? Uh, which, you know, makes me want to scream because it's uh, a challenge to me that the onus is on you. Hmm. I, as I recall, I covered your campaign, watched it very closely. You would never injected race until Ron DeSantis did. Um, so as we look at race going into 2020, the rising majority of the country um, are demanding that people's campaigns be diverse and reflect the country. Um, when we look at Florida, um, or actually when we look at the macro of the country, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, the Trump administration is losing suburban white women. Well, not really. I mean, 49% remain very loyal to the Republican Party and to the country, and we should acknowledge that. Um, but in Florida, an overwhelming amount of white women voted for Ron DeSantis. Yeah. So as we look through that lens, I'm curious your thoughts on um, if we are demanding candidates be diverse, we're demanding that their staff be diverse, and we're demanding um, or, or making cable news pundits and reporters yeah. redefine what it means to be electable. I'm curious, as you look back on your campaign and look ahead to 2020, um, how can candidates navigate the issue of race um, on a local level of, and a federal level and a yeah. national level? Well, first of all, if, if you're frustrated, you can only imagine my level of frustration when reporters, even now, uh, you know, post the race, uh, you know, ask me, you know, Andrew, would you change how you talked about race? And I'm thinking, have you talked to Mr. DeSantis about how he talked about <laughs> race and whether or not he would change the conversation and the way that he engages in it? I mean, this man started the campaign by telling the state of Florida not to monkey things up. Right. A, a Harvard and Princeton educated candidate for governor who certainly shouldn't have an absence of a lexicon um, uh, who decided that that's how he wanted to warn the people of the state of Florida around how not to mess things up in Florida. Um, I did what, what came to me instinctually. Um, and that wasn't to call him a racist. I said, the racists think he's a racist. I ain't call him a racist, right? <laughs> I, and, 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 and I will tell you, I, I did that fully recognizing that the moment I called Mr. DeSantis, or frankly anybody, the president or anybody a racist, that there was going to be a race to the corners, uh, that people would go to their tribes and their sides, and then we couldn't have much of a civilized conversation about um, what we have that shared between us. But the other thing I wasn't going to do, first of all, for obvious reasons, um, is to shrink from the fact that I'm black, and there's nothing to be, there's, and, and let me just say a little bit of what I mean about that. Um, in the primary process, as white voters got a little bit more accustomed to me as we competed in the Democratic primary, I had the least amount of money. I had $6 million to a combined spend by my opponents of more than $90 million. Uh, nobody thought we had a chance of winning, and I, and I get it. But, but when I would go in places repeatedly, eventually um, some of the white Democrats in the room would feel comfortable enough asking me, Andrew, do you think that you could, that Florida's ready to elect an African American? And I have to tell you, while some people in the room would sort of, you know, get a little touchy about that question, I felt like a sense of relief. It's sort of like in a, in a relationship, you know, or an elevator shaft, the further down it goes, the more comfortable you get. Like if you can assault a friend, and like you're still friends after you insult the friend, you're like, okay, we're at a different level. <laughs> so when people would bring up race, particularly white voters, I felt like, okay, we're at a different level. We may be making a breakthrough because what I felt was dangerous is if I allow voters to allow race to sit in the recesses of their minds yeah. and to control their judgments subconsciously, yeah. without ever really thinking about the fact that I'm making this judgment simply because 
this is unfamiliar to me. I, I don't know what to do with this, that I'm, a, I'm disadvantaging myself ultimately by not allowing that to be brought forward. And so when folks bought it for, I was like, yes, I'm, I'm black. It ain't a problem for me, is it? Are you? If, Cause if, if we are good, then we can go on to the fact that these folks are robbing us blind and taking away our health care and destroying our environment and are criminalizing your kids and mine yeah. together. Um, that we can then move on to the substantive pieces that matter um, in this conversation differently. And even in the conversation around criminal justice reform, I didn't shrink from talking about the fact that I'm a dad to three, you know, to three kids and two boys, two black boys. And the fact that the reason why I've got to get so animated around this issue of open season being declared on our young black men, particularly in my state, is because this has a direct impact on, on me. And so I just think the way we have, to, we, we have to deal with it, let's be honest about it. Don't be contrived. Don't make it, you don't have to, don't make it more complicated than what it is. Um, uh, we can address it and then we can, we can sort of move on to the other many dimensions that make me a candidate that I believe is the best candidate to help move this state forward for blacks, for brown folks, for white folks, uh, and everything in between, right? Um, there are other things that we can get to. Well, the president, when he calls me a thief and calls Stacey unqualified, those aren't, what he's doing is attempting to sow a seed of, of, um, of, of already built in sort of subjective bias that exists in people's minds. And so we can't let that stuff sort of go unchecked and not bring it up. And I think you can do it in a helpful way. I think you can do it in a non-toxic way. Um, you know, the president is good at throwing punches. And one of the things I wanted him to know was I was prepared to punch back. He spent more time. He spent more time. He spent more time on the governor's race in the state of Florida than he did on any race in the country. He spent more time defining and coming to the aid of Mr. Ron DeSantis. My opponent was not just Ron DeSantis. It was also Donald Trump. And in a state where Donald Trump enjoys 49.5% support, they got 49%. Yeah, yeah. And the difference between me and my opponent was 0 0.4, 30, about 30,000 votes out of 8.2 million votes cast in the race for governor. So if the question is, is whether my leaning into that or talking to that disadvantaged me more than it did predecessor Democrats, well, the truth is I got closer than any Democrat has since 1994 <laughs> in my state. So I would say to the, to the people who were offended around my acknowledgement that I was black, my guess is, is they probably weren't voting for me <laughs> to begin with. So you brought up 2020 uh, and, and punching back. I think a lot of people, as we look at the very crowded field of potential candidates uh, in 2020, people want to see a Democrat who is not afraid of punching back. Um, I know that your campaign sent out an email about next steps. Um, would you care to break any news here today oh, and get tell out us of what here. you're thinking about yeah, that, yeah. next? Yeah, the news, the news that I'm breaking is I plan to stay married to my wife. <laughs> we, are, we are trying to celebrate 10 years of marriage uh, in May. I want to... Well, black women are a core Democrat. Oh, Democrat get out of here. So, I'll talk please, to her about more. running, right? Um, <laughs> In all seriousness, this has been, I mean, I spent 21, 21 months of my life uh, sort of moving around the state of Florida talking to um, everybody who had a listening ear, right, who was willing to hear me out and to see me and that kind of thing. And uh, these campaigns are extremely uh, grueling. And what I am committed to doing is trying to do everything that I can between now and 2020 to make the state of Florida available and winnable for whoever the Democratic nominee for President of the United States is. That is the commitment, full on, full throttle. And, and, and on the punch back to Trump, because I think it's, you know, people have asked me, do you think you should have ignored the president more? I'm like, he ain't ignoring me, right? But I think the one thing that we've got to do, one is we can't let his, we can't let those insults that are intended to really cut deep, because we think a lot of these things are just surface field. They're not surface field. He's talking to a constituency. He is talking directly past us into the heart, the soul, the guts of some folks, that if they don't hear a disruptive 
message that sort of contradicts what he's saying or the seed that he's trying to plant, that thing can sit there and it can grow, it can blossom in the minds of voters. And so I do think it's important to chop it off where we possibly can. And, and, then, and then I think we have to take it higher. I don't think that we can stay, you know, wrestling with it. My grandmother had a saying, and I often quoted her on the trail, she would say, uh, baby, don't ever, ever, ever wrestle with pigs because you both get dirty, but the pig likes it. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not calling the president a pig, right? But, but if we're just analogizing here, right? And that is to say that he can stay in the mud all day and never pay the consequence, the full consequence. But for any of us, if we stayed in the mud all day, that's not a battle that we can win. But don't take that to mean that we don't have to punch back on the things that can be saying arguments that are cutting us at the knees. And we're going so high minded. We're so high minded that we're leaving where the regular voters are. We're leaving them behind. We got to go to them and then we got to kick it higher. Yeah. The president is a disaster. And now let me tell you what we're going to do to make it better right. for all of us. Right. Let's let's be willing to make that pivot. OK, so last question. Let me just drill down on this. Um, it doesn't sound like you have an announcement to make, no. but if asked to, because your, your race became a national race. So as you look at this field of candidates, if asked to join a ticket, are you open to that? Lord have mercy. Listen, I, <laughs> you, you, re you really want me divorced. I, I, <laughs> I know. We yeah. want you to stay married. We need I, that black woman vote. So we want you to stay married to your me, black wife. Let we me, do. Let me, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, you bad. I, uh, like I said, what I am committed to doing, and this is important, this is important work. Um, one of the mistakes of, I think, um, party nominees in my state in the past, and I think this probably exists in a lot of states, is that when we aren't successful, we pack up and then we move on to our next life. And I get why, let me tell you, after 21 months, I get why people are like, I am. I gave you everything that I had and then some, and you said, no, I'm out of here. Right, but that isn't the, that's not the conclusion that, that I draw. The conclusion I draw is that we've got to be in a, a real relationship yeah. with voters. And what that means is that that is not just inside of an election cycle, that's also outside of it. And so what my hope is, is that in Georgia and in Texas and in Florida, but also in Michigan and in Wisconsin, yeah. and in all these states where whether we saw success definitively, meaning we won, or whether we saw gains, that we're all gonna spend the time and the effort and the energy on cultivating those gains so that we can flip this thing over the long haul. That's okay. the thing that we've gotta do. All right. I'm committed to that. Thank you. Well, let me just say, I know the mayor's wife and she'd be amazing on any campaign trail. Um, <laughs> but with that, that we, are, we are out of time. So Indeed. thank you so thank much you all for everything you much. did on the trail Absolutely. and for being with us today. It's my thank treat. you so much. Thank y'all very much. Thank you. Thank you, sis. I appreciate that very much. So. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. All right, folks, back to our Roland Martin Unfiltered video in just one moment. Now, a word from one of our Roland Martin Unfiltered partners. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it again. Write down this website, marijuanastock.org. That's marijuanastock.org. I'm going to tell you why it matters. Legal marijuana has grown to become a $9 billion industry in roughly six years. Forbes magazines predicts the market will continue to grow to nearly $50 billion in the next 10 years. So whether you like it or not, legal marijuana is a growing industry and it is only going to get bigger. Now, if you're an investor, you get it. You look for business models that are easy to understand and industries that are trending up. Our friends at Transatlantic Real Estate made their business very simple. They buy land that supports legal marijuana operations and lease it to high paying tenants. So you are investing in the landlord of a licensed marijuana farm. Stop working so hard for your money. Let your money start working for you by investing in the legal cannabis industry. You can invest as little as $300 up to $10,000, but you can't wait. This crowdfunding opportunity is only available for a few more days. They say that you either make things happen, watch things happen, or sit around wondering what happened. Don't be the person watching and wondering. 
Don't let another investment boom get away from you. It's time to make something happen for you, your finances, and your family. And don't forget my pro tip. To be included, you must complete and confirm your application. And be sure to complete the process. Go to marijuanastock.org. That's marijuanastock.org. Get in the game, folks. Do it now before time runs out. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered Fit. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Because guess what? We come back live January 3rd. The blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hello. Y'all want some of this? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications. There's only one show out here, folks, in the digital world that's focused on you. Because here's the piece. I ain't afraid of Fox News. Come back live January 3rd. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. rollermartinunfiltered.com. <laughs> Thank you.